Why don't you stay if you can, or at least stay as long as you can. Um, and I just want to welcome everyone here tonight. It's going to be a little, a little loud, it sounds like. Um, I'd like to um, say a special thanks to Laura Bunker and Hardware for their community support of tonight's Conifer Area Council Town Hall meeting. And for those of you who have not been to a town hall meeting before, Conifer Area Council, we're going to do a changing of the guard, so come on down and have a seat, everybody. Conifer Area Council is a non-political organization that does not support or oppose any development, issue, political agenda, individual person, or business. We've asked all of our speakers to include these values in their presentations and to be nonpartisan, non-controversial, and to present just the facts. We also ask that you represent these values. So there will be no campaigning um, or signing of petitions or anything at the meeting this evening. There also will be no questions during the presentations, no questions or comments. But at 8 o'clock, about 8 o'clock when we start the town, um, the actual open house, um, all of the speakers will be here and ready to answer questions and comments and everything else. So, what is going on around here? First of all, I'd like to introduce Steve Harrelson, who is our resident engineer for CDOT. And he's going to talk a little bit about things going on with CDOT. Steve. Thank you. Um, just one big project coming up. There's actually a small project. We're going to uh, rework that the median at Shaver's Crossing. We're going to extend it, the depressed median about 200 feet up the hill, and then put a painted median clear around the corner. Um, that's going to be advertised uh, next week, so we would hope to start construction probably in early June. It should be fairly painless. Um, that portion um, will largely be you know, require some lane closures and shoulder closures, but uh, not no blasting or anything like that. And we'll try to do it, um, you know, not during the rush hour. Also with that project, we're going to replace three concrete panels um, down the hill between, uh, you know, on the concrete section, um, largely below Windy Point. Uh, we did that uh, a couple summers ago, or a couple falls ago, where we, at the end of rush hour, we we divert traffic to the other side, we remove the concrete, um, put in some drains underneath to stop the, the expansive soil, and then replace the concrete, and the concrete's cured and ready for the rush hour the next morning. We can do it in 20 hours or so. So we're planning to do that in three locations. Um, again, we're hoping that that's going to be transparent to the traveling public. Um, no other projects on the horizon. We've. Uh, Got a design for Pine Junction on the shelf should funding arise, but um, we don't have any funding uh, anywhere in the near term. Um, nothing else uh, going on on 285. Um, so if you have any questions, I will be around afterwards. Thank you, Steve. Okay, next I would like to introduce our new. Um, Executive Director for the Chamber, Conifer Area Chamber of Commerce. Susan Beams is our new Executive Director. Susan. Thank you very much. And yes, my name is Susan Beams, and I have the wonderful pleasure of being the new Executive Director at the Conifer Area Chamber of Commerce. And thank you very much for having me here this evening. First of all, I wanted to tell you that the Conifer Area Chamber is 282 members strong today. Three short of my goal of 285 members. So if anybody wants to help me out with that, see me right over there afterwards. And, uh, but we are growing strong and doing a lot of wonderful things for our community. Uh, we have a lot of things on our calendar, but first of all, tomorrow night, we are cash mobbing Bailey. It is a promotion that we have to help support shopping locally. We're meeting at Aspen, Creek, Aspen Peak Cellars at 5, and then we are going to unleash our mob on downtown Bailey. The merchants are all staying open late until 7. More 
Lumber is having a special 25% off everything you can fit in the bag. And that's a lot of nuts and bolts. So come down for that. Also, PeaceWorks has a boutique down there, and they're offering a 25% off their items. And a lot of the other merchants have, have specials, but it's really to support shopping locally. So all of you are welcome to come and meet us at Aspen Park, Aspen Peak, and uh, we will mob downtown Bailey. We're also having a really exciting lunch and learn on the 29th, and this is going to be at Conifer Community Church. We are pleased to announce that John Michael Keyes of the I Love You Guys Foundation is going to be teaching about carpe audience, or how to seize your audience. He's using some uh, science from how brain chemistry works to keep your audience for attention and not put them all to sleep with your PowerPoint presentation that goes on and on and on. So that'll be an exciting lunch and learn. And then also our meetings. Our meetings are on the second Friday morning of every month at 7.15 at Brooks Place Tavern. So you can come even if you're not a member, and we'd love to meet you and let you know a little bit more about what the Chamber's doing. Next month, we're also having a mixer at Bandamere, which is a mixer with all the Chambers in the area, and that'll be a lot of fun because our members are going to get to drive the cars, too, so I don't know. That sounds like a lot of fun to watch. And save the date, uh, July 12th is our second annual Elevation Celebration on Sutton Road, and we've got music and food and fun for the whole family. So I hope to see you all there and thank you very much for giving me a few minutes of your time and I'll see you again next meeting. Thanks so much and I'll be right back there if you have any questions. Have a great night. Thank you Susan and welcome. We're glad to have you. Okay, next we're going to have Peter Barkman, um, Conifer Area Council board member, come up and talk about the development updates. Peter. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, and the handout you picked up as you came in is our summary of the development updates, which we put together from the announcements that come from the county planning and zoning. We try to keep only the current issues in here. Uh, so these are applications that are new or they're in the being processed. Uh, we're going to try to get a, a page on our website that will include all the old ones, but that's going to take a little bit of doing, uh, all the uh, uh, ones that are pending. Uh, I would like to point out that on the top there's a new issue, and this is Jefferson County Planning and Zoning, is addressing the accessory dwelling units, the ADUs. These are those mother-in-law units or granny flats uh, that are pretty tightly restricted right now. And what you can do if you have an accessory building on your property and you want somebody to occupy it, they're looking at loosening those up and they're seeking input uh, from the community. So you might want to contact Heather Gutherless. She's here and will be here at the open house and you can address questions to her and her emails here and her phone number. They really would like input on this to, to, to formulate the new plans or new uh, uh, oh, uh, regulations for this to open it up. Um, the only other issues that I see in here, uh, also on that new issues, there's a little typo in there. There is no hearing in February. It's a bad date. It's a typo that's came from an old uh, document. Um, I would point out that every now and then there are uh, applications that have been sitting there uh, in, in limbo or being held. And they'll, they'll rear their heads uh, from time to time. And an example is the Cottonwood Canyon uh, development on South Maxwell. It has an only nine date that had been sitting there and it has now come back for them. And, uh, uh, gone ahead and uh, had hearings that was approved. So we just come out and take a look and see where things are. But also like to point out, we have the dates for the slash sites in here, and we, we've got them both in the front and the back, and they're contradictory. It's another typo. These are put together by community, uh, committee late at night. In the back of the handout for the slash sites, the Elk Creek Fire uh, slash collection is June 21st and 22nd. Coal Creek is July 12th and 13th. We'll have updated ones on this on our website as well. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And next we have Brian Mosby, who's the Conifer Library Supervisor, um, to talk about a few things going on, I think, coming up this summer. Brian. Good evening. Okay. 
got a few things on the agenda here. Uh, first of all, it's never too early to start thinking about Summer Reading Club. Uh, it is for kids, teens, and adults. So we'd like to hit all of our goals, get everybody signed up in the community, uh, get those goals, make Conifer Library look great to the rest of the libraries in the system. Uh, let's see. And with those, of course, are always uh, programs. We have some programs coming up on 3D printing, uh, optical illusions, bugs for nutrition, which I think you get to actually eat a bug, and uh, magic, of course, so some popular programs. Uh, one of the things that we like to promote also is homebound services in the library. If you know somebody who can't get to the library due to either temporary or permanent conditions, uh, please have them or stop by and get an application or have them stop by at the library if they can get there or have someone pick one up. Uh, and apply for that. We have volunteers who can pick out items, bring it to them, mail it to them, whatever they need. Okay? It's a great service. No cost to you there. And we're in the midst of One Book for Colorado, so I'm giving out free books for youngsters, if you know youngsters. The library is uh, one of the places where you can pick one of these up. I do have a couple more left. I've been giving them out to all the kids around here. Uh, we're also having a special celebration tomorrow night, um, 4 o'clock actually, tomorrow afternoon. It's going to be a special story time of Grumpy Bird and all his friends. So if you know youngsters, let them know. And let's see, back in March, our director did come around to some of the libraries and explain some of the situations going on at the library. If you're interested in the information, I do have this packet. It's a little hefty. It's their whole presentation they had on the challenges that the library is facing uh, and what the future may look like for Jefferson County Public Library. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Now, I asked um, Jen Anderson of Staunton State Park to come and talk a little bit about the park. She was unable to come tonight, but she did um, send me an email with all the information. So according to Jen, the first year of the park has been a great success. We have seen over 120,000 visitors since opening day, May 18, 2013. We are well on our way to passing the estimated visitation of 130,000 annually. The Davis Dams project should be wrapped up sometime in May. We will refill and stock the ponds as weather and water rights permit. There are no additional construction projects planned for the immediate future. We do have and we have received funding from GOCO for Phase 2, the visitor center, and trails around the new Davis Ponds. Extremely exciting. It is too soon to tell the exact timing and details of each of those projects right now. We are looking forward to our second summer. We are anticipating another busy season as more people hear about us, so get the word out. Please feel free to contact Jen directly at the park if you have specific questions. Staunton State Park um, is just one of the most wonderful places, um, just one of those places that we have in our own backyard. We are so lucky. So, anyway, next I would like to bring um, Chief Bill McLaughlin up to, um, he's the Deputy Fire Chief for Elk Creek Fire, Bar fire Department, and he's going to um, talk about the outlook for the upcoming fire season. Bill. season um, you know it's always hard for us to tell how a fire season is going to be from year to year uh, Colorado can have very dramatic fire seasons unfortunately as well as ones that are uh, relatively quiet and a lot of times we can't uh, really predict that entirely in advance but we do have uh, you know basically the, the information uh, that we've got right now from the National Weather Service and the uh, um, National Interagency Fire Center. Basically at this point they're forecasting that 
It's going to be a very active season across the entire West. Uh, there, you know, the forecast right now is that uh, the summer is going to be warmer than normal uh, in all the areas that you can see that are brown on the map, which accounts for a considerable amount of the country. And unfortunately for California, they're continuing to experience uh, very, you know, dry, uh, very warm conditions, and are predicted to continue. Uh, we're in a little bit better shape as far as the weather forecast goes, just in that, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it is forecast to be probably warmer than normal, but not really at this point an exceptionally warm summer. Uh, so basically, the uh, the national map is looking like uh, basically the entire west coast is going to be, uh, you know, have uh, much elevated. Uh, fire risk, as well as the entire southwest and extending into uh, southern Colorado. Uh, right now, they're basically giving us uh, even odds of it being uh, normal or above normal uh, fire season for this part of Colorado. Uh, one thing that is impacting this quite a bit, you know, we are fortunate that the drought conditions here locally have Quite a bit. Okay. Is that? All right. Okay. Uh, but uh, you know, it uh, it is over most of the West that uh, we're seeing continued drought conditions, and uh, you know we're still remain uh, just out of drought conditions in this area. Uh, some parts of Colorado are uh, still experiencing a fairly significant drought including the southeast part of the state where conditions are now being reported as worse than the, than the Dust Bowl period uh, back in the 1930s. Uh, so it's not really a great situation yet, uh, just at this point more or less acceptable. Um, another issue that we've been seeing across Colorado and that has uh, impacted uh, a number of areas has been uh, various uh, forest pests. Uh, you know, you're probably all familiar with the pine beetle uh, infestation that uh, attacked much of northern and central Colorado. And some of the biggest fires that we've seen in the state have been burning through those beetle killed forests. Uh, the beetles have slowed down largely because they've pretty much eaten all of the lodgepole pine uh, in the, you know, the areas that are strictly lodgepole pine. Uh, however, we're now seeing uh, you know, over the past couple of years, increase in two other pests, the uh, spruce beetle, which has really been impacting the southern areas, and the big uh, West Fork fire outside of Pagosa Springs last year, uh, you know, which ended up being the second largest fire by acreage in, uh, in Colorado's history, burned through uh, beetle kill spruce. And then uh, a third uh, pest that we're seeing that unfortunately started to show up around here is the spruce budworm. Now the spruce beetle attacks spruce trees. Uh, the budworm, uh, the budworm actually uh, attacks Douglas fir. And if you drive around the community here, you'll see that a lot of the Douglas fir trees are now dying in this area. So far, it's not reached what you know we consider an epidemic level. Uh, but we are seeing a lot more uh, dead trees in the forest uh, over the last year or two compared to what it has been. Uh, and that's obviously going to impact our, our local fire danger if, uh, if that continues. So overall, once again, we've got a, a pretty active fire season anticipated nationally. Uh, we don't know what the front range is going to do. Uh, and but right now, as we're still sitting right now, our fire danger is pretty much even to where it was uh, in 2013 at this time. So unless we see a significant uh, weather pattern shift between now and June 1st, we are going to anticipate that there's a good chance that we'll see uh, big fires in the area again next year or this summer. Uh, you know, and. One of the things that we got to recognize is that uh, whatever happens this time of the year doesn't really 
impact the longer term. It's keeping us from having fires, you know, start early like the Lower North Fork fire was two years ago. But last year we had our, our last significant uh, snowstorm, May 9th. We had our first uh, wildfire, which is the one there uh, that uh, the Bluebell Fire in Evergreen uh, happened uh, at the beginning of June, like three weeks later. So uh, it only takes uh, that short of a window between snowfall and uh, the beginning of fire season, unfortunately. So a um, couple of updates. I think there's been a lot of talk about uh, the uh, availability of resources in Colorado. Uh, probably the biggest one that everybody's been following is the proposal by the state to uh, purchase aircraft. And uh, I did find out this morning that that uh, has passed and is going to the uh, governor for signature. And that will include uh, uh, that will include $21 million that's going to purchase two uh, detection aircraft that will be sent up after uh, lightning storms, uh, as well as uh, contracting for helicopters and the large air tankers. Uh, right now, the state, you know, up until now, has had uh, basically one or two of the what are called single engineer tankers, the very small ones, on contract. Uh, starting with this summer, they're planning to have uh, two of the very uh, the large aircraft available as well. So we're going to have resources that we didn't have in the past. Unfortunately, the federal government, on the other hand, is still uh, very far behind their plan to replace their air tankers. Uh, back in, um, well, even 10 years ago, the federal government ran 44 air tankers for wildfires. Uh, as of last year, they were down to nine. Uh, this year, they're anticipating having 10. Uh, so we're still uh, basically running at about 25% uh, strength. Even though, once again, we are expecting uh, the season to be busy. Another big uh, project that we've been working on ever since the Lower North Fork Fire has been uh, a way to dispatch ground resources in Colorado to big fires uh, uh, more effectively. And um, you know, it's really picked up uh, steam after the Black Forest Fire last year. Um, you know, with uh, 500 homes being burned in that, and uh, all of that being basically neighborhoods, the entire fire, you know, the state has had a very uh, difficult time. Basically, after the Black Forest Fire, we tried to, or we've been working on a plan with Colorado Springs. Uh, Elk Creek Fire is very heavily involved in that, and three or four other fire departments, along with uh, the state, to put together uh, a method to send fire engines to these big fires much more quickly. We're going to be doing the first test of that system on May 3rd, uh, and that's going to involve uh, most of the fire departments here in the in the uh, foothills, as well as fire departments all the way from Willow County down to uh, Colorado Springs. Uh, so that's been a, a big, a big push forward that we've been involved in trying to improve our ability to respond to those incidents. And then finally, on a local basis, uh, you know, thanks to uh, the passage of the of the uh, bill levy last year, we were able to purchase two new. Uh, Wildland Urban Interface engines, and those are in service, and will be available to uh, increase our protection here locally. Um, you know, for this fire season, uh, we have two uh, uh, water tenders that are off-road capable that are have also been ordered. Unfortunately, they won't be here uh, for uh, this coming fire season. Uh, last thing I'd like to point out: uh, you know, we've been working with a number of communities on the Firewise community program. That's something we want to encourage with other communities. Uh, a lot, number of the grants that we are uh, pursuing at this time to do mitigation are available only to those communities that have uh, Firewise communities um, 
designation. And basically that involves having you know, neighborhoods get together and put their own effort into uh, protecting their, or improving their community. Uh, that's, that's a program that we're trying to increase. And then uh, the last thing with that is that uh, many folks don't realize we do have a tax credit here in Colorado for any mitigation you do on your individual homes. If you have any questions about that, please feel free to talk to me after. Thank you. And or services are added, and those dollars keep going up. 
Obviously, in slow times of, of property tax revenue, um, when those revenue dollars tend to decline, the question is, when you look at, at the services offered by the county, what we are doing, what's mandated, what's not, what's there? What do all of you demand? What do you want to see? And what are we able to provide to all of you? Also, we're only going to projected right now from the assessor's office is we're only going to see a 1% growth in property tax revenue. Now keep in mind, residential property tax revenue is on a slight increase. However, commercial property tax revenue is actually has decreased and has been very flat lately. Lately, last couple years. <laughs> Just note, if you are a business owner and you play property, commercial property tax, you know this all too well. Business property tax is 3.72 times more expensive than residential property tax. That is flat. That makes up a bulk or a majority of our property tax income coming in for revenues for the county to do county business. Also, we have seen, we talked about it today, $1.9 million reduction for human services from the state for this year. That continues from years ago. It keeps, we keep getting cut. We keep having less and less dollars coming in from the state, from the federal government, but we're seeing an increase in our mandated services that we have to provide through bills being ran at the state level and also at the federal level. Plus, we're still seeing they say the economy is improving, but we're still at record number of people coming into human services looking for assistance. Capital needs, as I spoke to, we have aging buildings, aging infrastructure. We've been, I wouldn't say ignoring it, trying to put that off, redirect those funds elsewhere, but there's only so long that we can put those, fund, those, those repairs off and uh, before we have to do that it's a huge crisis. When you look at our expected, this is 2014 expect, expected budget revenues, you can see the big piece of the pie here, money comes from property tax revenue, residential and business. And as we go through intergovernmental and all, is that like five minutes for him now? I've already burned up my time, Angela. Oh, man. All right. So as we go through, I have copies of this presentation. I don't want to eat into Commissioner Ty's. But uh, real quick, flood recovery. We're working with FEMA, um, uh, Homeland Security, um, the Colorado Department of, of Homeland Security to go through working with the governor's office for repairs. I've, I've been amazed at how well CDOT has done especially in Cold Creek Canyon. And we were fortunate in some areas the storm tended to leapfrog as it went through. But we did have some damage up in uh, Upper Bear Creek. Uh, slash treatments, there was a discussion. Slash collection sites, the dates are here. These are the correct dates. So if you want it also, the, an RFP went out in January to look at slash collection. And it was a holistic approach for slash collection and how do you treat it, process it, mulch it, turn it into energy, do a wide variety of things for it. We had three bidders. They were um, uh, a team of county employees sat down, went through all those proposals. And um, there being one individual and a team, <laughs> sorry, Angela, I'm going, uh, is, uh, is being, being asked to, um, to, to answer questions. Fish. All right, so uh, real quick, uh, sorry. There, there, there's a slide there back on Roadwork, road find out Roadwork road work near you. You can hit the website and call. If you see potholes, call us and tell us where they are. We'll come out and fix them. Yeah. That's potholes, not potheads. <laughs> Pot uh, West Connect, I want to talk about that just to you. We've talked about that for years. That's on Western Beltway. But one of the reasons I want to put this slide up, this goes into what Commissioner Rocher talked about economic development. Up at the north part of there, by the Northwest Parkway, right near the interlocking loop, we have an airport, Rocky Mountain Airport. We have some land there. We have a development called Verve. 
and Verve is a, a, a development the county owns the land. We're trying to recruit businesses to locate in the Verve area. We've got some exciting businesses that have contacted us that are at least looking at the property. Those will be jobs. That will be uh, revenue if we can get some businesses to locate uh, around there. I want to show on this slide because it's really important that these businesses have good transportation. And right now on the north uh, west part of the county, our transportation system isn't, isn't state of the art. So uh, we want to attract businesses, we got to get state of the art transportation. Planning and zoning, uh, uh, Heather's going to talk about that, so I, I just, I'd probably get it wrong. But I want to chickens and bees. <laughs> um, yeah, we get chicken and bee, chickens and bees now. Uh, human services, uh, Commissioner Rocher talked about the needs increasing. That's a big deal. I want to highlight uh, veteran services. We um, have a veterans court that we're starting now in the county. If veterans get into trouble and they, it's not a, very, a real serious crime, there's an opportunity for them to get counseling and to avoid the normal incarceration, the normal justice system. Because these veterans have done great work for our country, we want to work with them. Uh, it, you have to qualify for the program, not everybody gets in, but it's a way to, 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 to you know, work with veterans and uh, hopefully have a successful outcome for them. And that veterans court has just started uh, in the county. Boards and commissions, we just went through uh, uh, appointing people to boards and commissions, but, um, the, uh, board, but if you want to get involved, uh, look at all the different boards and commissions we have. One of the new ones is the Sustainability Commission. Uh, we're going to look at uh, uh, opportunities to, uh, to find, uh, take advantage of what's going on in the county as far as renewable energy, recycling, whatever it is. The Sustainability Commission is going to look at that and see if we can you know, leverage the power of all the different groups that are working on, on those kinds of ideas. Uh, so look at, get, on, get online and look at all the opportunities to volunteer at the county. If you see something interesting, please apply. Uh, Marijuana. Uh, Commissioner Roche gave me the idea of getting a task force together to uh, uh, look at the marijuana issues and see what's right for Jefferson County. So we just appointed a task force to look at the marijuana issues and see do we want to allow retail sales in Jefferson County in the unincorporated areas of the county? Do we want to allow uh, retail grow operations in the unincorporated parts of the county? This task force is going to look at those issues and report back to the uh, commission on whether or not what, what's right for the county. Those meetings are public meetings. So if anybody wants to come and provide input, listen, be involved, you can. Uh, they, they meet on Mondays, and I think about two weeks, yeah. about two weeks, uh, they'll start meeting. Uh, they'll have information on, on, on our website. But we want to find out what the county people are thinking for what's, what's right for it. Uh, if I can yeah, answer. 31 people apply, and it's a balance. For and against, we try to get it as a good balance. That's right. And uh, if you want to hear about the, more on the marijuana issue, we're having a telephone town hall. The number is 877-229-8493. We're also going to call out and then just ask people what do they think about what's right for Jefferson County. Uh, you can call in and listen, or maybe we'll call you. Uh, if you want to get that number, you can write it down, or it'll be on the website as well. And you can ask questions. You can, yeah, you can ask. It's interactive. Call in and ask us questions, give us your thoughts, whatever you want to do. So we'll do that. And then again, how to connect with Jeffco. We want to hear from, the, from everybody. Uh, so feel free to, to get on our, uh, our webpage. Feel free to call any of the commissioners, Faye, Don, or myself. And we'll be happy to talk to you. Uh, come to any of our meetings. So we always have a calendar published on our website. Two so hours and ten minutes. There you right. go. A two-hour presentation. Yeah, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll yeah. be here. Don will be here if you have any questions. And also, I just want to say, in the back here, we have copies of the Jefferson County Economic Development Corporation Annual Report, an economic profile for the entire county, phenomenal information, the 23 accomplishment of the Board of County sure, Commissioners. Sure, the book. <laughs> <laughs> and then, budget okay. stuff. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, next, we have Heather Gutherless, who is a planner at Jeffco, and she's gonna. Um, she's actually been a member also of the Conifer Recreation Coalition. They are just um, finalizing the master plan on Project Place, so she's going to talk a little bit about that and a little bit about the Conifer Community Plan update.
technology, it always gets you, you know? Okay. Shirley, as Shirley said, I'm Heather Gutherless and I'm with Jefferson County Planning and Zoning. I have the pleasure of talking to you about two exciting projects that are coming up. Well, one of them is near the end stages, but I have, I'm able to talk to you about two projects tonight. First, I am a member of the Conifer Recreation Coalition's Steering Committee. And this committee was formed to do a Conifer Area Recreation <coughs> Master Plan. This, late last year, let's see, I'm not sure if all of you can see me, see the slides. Late last year, the Conifer Recreation Coalition collected a lot of community input to identify the unmet recreation needs in the Conifer area. Now, a recreation master plan is being finalized, so we're in the final stages of that, and it's going to offer some suggestions for implementation, for implementation, for ideas, uh, strategies for recreation in the Conifer area. The complete plan will be done in June 2014. The purpose of this plan was to develop the guidelines for how the Conifer community can expand and improve a wide variety of recreational opportunities inside and outside throughout the Conifer area. One thing that we do want to stress is that this is not another plug for a recreation district. We're not trying to do that. This is trying to do recreation master planning to see what is available currently and what is needed in the future. There are going to be three elements to the master plan. And this is a really unique plan in that two of the elements are in a plan form, and the last element, the communication media, is a website. So this is kind of different than any plan that I've really worked with before. There's going to be the priority initiatives that have been talked about with the community for Conifer Recreation. There's going to be four toolkits in the master plan, and then there's going to be that communication media. The priority initiatives, the four initiatives that were found through community input, are improved to improve communications and exposure of existing recreation opportunities. There are a lot of things that are out there right now, and people might not know about them. Also to realize trail connections. There's some trail connections that really <coughs> need to be completed that could be very useful to the community. Expanded outdoor organized recreation that includes hiking clubs and outdoor youth sports. Supports the development, promotion, and or repurposing of community places. These are areas where you might be able to have a family reunion gathering or a wedding, something like that. The implementation tools, these I think will be extremely useful in this plan. So there are certain strategies that came out as being the priorities, and then there are the best practices. And the, this part of the plan will give ideas for how to implement, how to complete some of the ideas that came out of this planning effort. The communication media, like I said, it will mainly be a website that's going to be created, and that will provide the community with initi the initiatives and implementation tools, and it will also include a recreation map, recreation activity lists, and feature outdoor community events, all in one place. So right now there's several different places, websites, that have this information, but this will be all in one place. And that will also be completed in June of 2014. So the Conifer Recreation Coalition has done a lot of work up to this point in time. And at this point, what we need is your help. We're finishing up the plan. And this is not a county-initiated project. I'm one of the representatives on the steering committee, but this really was a push from the community. And therefore, in order to implement this plan, we really need help from the community to do it. it it's really essential in actually making this plan something that doesn't just sit on the shelf, but something that actually gets implemented and put into the community. So if this has piqued your interest, we would like you to contact us at conifercoalition at gmail.com. Thanks.
my guests. My next project that I'm working on for the county, so this is a county-initiated project, which is different than the Conifer Recreation Coalition, is the update of the Conifer 285 Area Corridor Plan. There is currently a plan in place like Shirley was talking about. We have those plans at the back and I'll be sticking around at the end to talk more about them. But we are just in the infancy of starting this project. We are using this plan right now and it's been in, some, in effect in some form since about 1985. This plan gives future land use recommendations. So it doesn't change anybody's existing zoning. You can continue to do with your land what you're allowed to do under current zoning. However, if you want to come in and rezone your property, do something different, then that's where this plan comes into play. And it really influences how the future land use recommendations, will, what the future land use recommendations will be. So it's a really important land use document that's used by our Planning Commission and Board of County Commissioners. The last time the plan was updated was in 2003. We're updating them again now. They're going to be slightly different. So right now it's a pretty thick document and we have since, we have since the last plan, we've adopted a comprehensive master plan that has a lot of the general policies that relate to the entire county. Those are policies that talk about things like staying away from hazard areas or floodplains. What we're trying to do with these area plans now is to really condense everything into what is specific to the conifer area. Those land use recommendations that are specific to the area, if there are any specific transportation improvements that are important to the area, or visual resources that people think need to be preserved. It's going to get very, very condensed and very specific to the area. Also, another big change is that we've been seeing, we've updated so far, we've updated most of our community plans and made them into area plans. And we have found that they are much shorter than what they were previously. There is, there's going to be a land use map that is much more specific than the current land use map in the plan. Right now there's ranges based on slope and hazards, can range anywhere from 5 acres to 35 acre recommendation. We're going to look at all of those hazards and constraints and put them into a map and see, get, try to give a more specific density recommendation to give more guidance to people in the future. We're also updating the Evergreen Plan at the same time, so we might be looking at a boundary change between the Conifer and Evergreen Plan. So that's something that you might be interested in. If you feel like you're from Conifer, but you're really in the Evergreen Plan, we're going to be looking at that. We're projecting that the plan will be complete in December of 2015. So it's going to start. We're planning on having some kickoff meetings this summer. We're planning on having about five to ten meetings. And then ending it with public hearing before the Planning Commission at the end of 2015. I'll be sticking around, my cards are in the back. Please email me or call me if you have any questions or if you want to be involved in this process. Um, as Heather said, uh, the original plan was done in 1987. Um, we updated the plan in 2003 and we actually initiated that from Conifer. Um, more than it coming from the county. Um, this time it's more the county initiating um, less public process than we had last time. So, um, Conifer Area Council is again doing a community survey to get input from all of you um, regarding what you want. And John is going to come up and just talk just very briefly about that. Um, so again, we want your input, and he's going to be talking about the survey that we're going to be getting out there in the next few days. Thank you, Jerry. Real quickly, um, County Area Council does a, a community survey about every four years, and we had decided we were probably going to put it off for one more year. We did it in 2010. But when we found, about, found out about the uh, update to the community plan by the county, we thought, you know, we really ought to do that survey now. It would be a great way to get input into that plan. It's our plan, it affects us. So look for materials and resources and announcements. 
We're going to try and kick it off May 1, run it for about a month, and uh, it'll be electronic, but there will also be hard copy of the survey. It's fairly long, about 40 questions. We're working on that now, but we're kind of excited about that. If any of you represent companies here or banks or service organizations, and we're trying to get out to all of these groups, and uh, we have a short time frame to do it. So please come and see me or Shirley after the meeting, and we can give you more information. But you'll start hearing about it probably in a couple of weeks to make it public. Thanks. Okay, and now we're going to hear from Kurt Valentine with um, MALT, Mountain Area Land Trust. They have been doing an amazing amount of work and, you know, getting, getting land in the conifer area. They're going to talk a little bit about that. It's, it's interesting putting the pieces together, and I think that's, Kurt's going to talk a little bit about that. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to introduce uh, Matt Ashley. Uh, He's on staff. Uh, we're both land conservation specialists with Mountain Area Land Trust. We have a board member, Janice Tang, and uh, our ambassador, uh, Fred Van Dusen. They're both landowners in the conifer area that have conservation easements. So, with that, um, we'll start the presentation quicker. Back and forth. Um, we're a local land trust. Uh, we've we were established in 1992. We uh, migrated or matured from an all-volunteer organization to an organization with four full-time staff and six part-time staff. I'm a part-time staff. Uh, we're a non-government, uh, non-profit organization that works with cooperative with landowners to place conservation easements on their property, working together to decide what is allowed on their property and what conservation values they want to protect. Uh, we're accredited with the National Land Trust in 2012. Uh, what does that mean? It means that we meet the national standards, of best management practices, um, we're financially sound, and we um, are in a position to provide conservation easements and monitor those conservation easements in perpetuity. So our, our mission is to say scenic vistas, natural areas, wildlife habitat, working ranches, historic lands for the benefit of the community and to leave a legacy for future generations. Uh, our service area started out to be Jefferson, the mountainous areas of Jefferson County and Clear Creek County uh, we, over time, added Park County, and recently we just added Gilpin and Teller County. We have 65 conservation easements, uh, totaling approximately 20,000 acres. Uh, we just finished a comprehensive uh, management plan, conservation management plan, and we identified priority areas. And one of our priority areas is the conifer Highway 285 corridor uh, priority area basically is from Marshdale to Conifer, Shaker's Crossing to Shawnee, Pine Junction to Buffalo Creek and Foxton. So out of those 65 conservation easements, 36 of them are in this priority area, the Conifer area, or 55%. So the majority of our easements are right here in Conifer. 45% of the total acreage. And and that's saying something because we have a lot of large properties down in Park County. So uh, this is sort of the land ownership pattern. Uh, the mall conservation easements with the private landowners are in the red. Uh, other protected lands like uh, Jefferson County open space and Denver Mountain Parks are in yellow. And the opportunity for us to start putting pieces of the puzzle together are the green landowners with more than 80 acres. Uh, the big block there in the lower corner, right hand corner, is the Butterfield property out at, uh, on Foxton, the Resort Valley Ranch. And uh, some of this area, I wish I had a pointer over there, is the South Ridge Road uh, area. And uh, Moving up is the 
Pleasant Park area. And we just added one out at Shawnee, which is the Long Meadow Ranch. So we're trying to put these pieces of the puzzle together to save those scenic vistas, the wildlife habitat, the working ranches. And so here again, the, the opportunity is are those 80 acre parcels or, or greater in the service area. And um, in the past, we were pretty much reactive, and now we're going out and trying to contact these landowners, and we will be writing letters, uh, making phone calls, using neighbors to talk to neighbors, but uh, that, that's what we're trying to do uh, this year. Uh, but let me explain the conservation easement process, or what are the benefits of the conservation easement. The benefits are variable, they depend upon the landowner's uh, size of their property and location, the amount of development rights that they give up, and they have to have an appraiser, an appraisal, a before and after appraisal, uh, and then there's some upfront costs. So what are the benefits? There's the end benefit is a state tax credit that you that the landowner can sell. Normally on our conservation easement, it's a normal, it's a net benefit to the landowner of anywhere from $250,000 to $350,000. We have several landowners that have done several easements based on the size of their property. So, uh, what are the benefits? It allows the current property owner to have a vision of how they want to see their property managed and into the future. So after they sell the property, uh, um, leave it to their heirs or whatever, their wishes are monitored by Mountain Area Land Trust into the future. Uh, besides the state tax credits, there's also federal uh, tax donations that can be used over 20 years. And there's also the uh, reduction in estate taxes, if you're worried about estate taxes. Um, the picture there is that Long Meadow Ranch out by Shawnee, if you uh, recognize that. So what are the public benefits? Uh, the Conifer Community Plan uh, talks about maintaining the look and feel of the community. So it uh, saves our scenic vistas, protects our natural areas, provides wildlife habitat, and since, it, since conservation easements, quote unquote, limit a certain amount of future development, it contributes to our community the way we kind of like it right now, or whatever, and it's maintained into the future. So, uh, in summary, if you want to find out more about <coughs> conservation easements, uh, we have a table over here, and it's time, and I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you'd like to support us, we have an annual event. It's called Night in the Park, and it's on August 9th. It's all of her three sisters. Thank you. And that is a gorgeous park, all of her three sisters. Okay. Well, next we were supposed to have our state senator, um, Jeannie Nicholson, and our state representative, Sherry Giroux. Um, however, I know they're doing a lot of late nights at the legislature right now, so um, uh, neither one of them were able to make it. Um, we have our um, sheriff's department back here um, to answer any questions. Um, we have all kinds <coughs> of people to talk to, and I want to bring up a couple of um, events that will be coming up. First of all, Saturday, May 10th is the Spring Pulling It Recycling Event. There are um, lots of flyers and everything on the, pay, on the tables back here. Um, Saturday, April 26th, is the Night Health Fair at Our Lady of Pines Catholic Church. Also, April 26th and the 27th is the Mountain Area Home and Garden Show at Evergreen High School. Um, then Saturday, May 17th, is the Community Veterans Coalition Rendezvous. And then Saturday, July 12th, You've heard about it before, but it's the Elevation Celebration 5K Run. 
um, it's going to be just a, it's going to be so much fun this year. So um, we hope to see you at all of those events. Our next town hall meeting is the, I'm not sure what date in September, but it's watch, watch for emails. If you are not on our email list, please get on that because we will get information out to you about all the town hall meetings and anything um, that we're involved in. And thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, I know that all the parents of the kids had all your seats there for a little while, but thank you for um, sticking around and, and being here and um, learning more about the community and, and caring about the community. That's the important thing. So, um, and last but not least, I would like to again thank more um, lumber, lumber and hardware um, for their community support of this town hall meeting and Sharon Trope with My Mountain Town for um, taping tonight. That will be on her website and ours for um, the meeting tonight. So thank you all for coming. Stick around, eat more cookies, get more water and coffee, and talk to all the speakers. Thank you.